Theory with Bob. Hey, what's happening, beautiful geniuses? Trumpeter Bobby Spellman here. And if you're just getting into listening to or playing jazz music, or you're interested in learning how to improvise on your instrument, you may be asking yourself, how does all this jazz business work? How much of the music is improvised versus written down? What are the roles of each of the instruments in a jazz band? And how is it possible that a bunch of musicians can all be creating music spontaneously without it sounding like total chaos? Well, today I'm going to try to demystify the mechanics of jazz and try to shed some light on why it is such an exciting style of music to play and to listen to. But in order to do so, I'm going to need a little help from my friends. Julian Smith on the bass. Evan Hyde on the drums and Julia Chen on the piano. And we're going to do a little demonstration of uh, some of the mechanics of how a jazz performance works and play through a little tune for you and have some fun. So let's get started. We're going to start out with the bass. Now the bass is the backbone of most jazz groups. The bass has two very important jobs simultaneously. First, the bass player's job is to play the time, usually in the form of a walking bass line, consisting of mostly quarter notes and some embellishments. And the other thing the bass player does is establish the harmony by playing the root notes and connecting them with the uh, chord tones and passing tones. So the bass player is going to be playing the time while also holding down the harmony for the rest of the band. And uh, it's a big job. But Julian's capable of it. He's, he's the guy. All right, we're going to bring the drums now. All right, Evan, come on in with the drums. The drummer's job is to embellish the time and to interact with the soloists and with the melody in order to drive the music forward and give it a, a little bit more excitement. Evan here is playing a typical swing pattern on the ride cymbal and holding down the two and four on the hi-hat. That leaves his left hand and his foot to accent the music in any way he would choose improvisationally throughout the piece. Now, unlike in rock and pop music, the drummer has a lot of freedom to play around with the groove. So it's not a strict drum beat, but it can be a variable pattern in order to be able to interact with the other musicians while we're improvising. All right, with that, we're gonna bring in Julia on the piano. And here we go. The pianist's job is to lay down the chords and uh, help out with the harmony, as well as play solos and play melodies, especially in the case of a piano trio. Now, once again, in jazz, unlike in rock and pop music, there isn't a set rhythm that the pianist or other harmonic instrument player needs to play, but rather they have the opportunity to improvise with those rhythms, as long as those chords fit the underlying form. Now, this is called accompanying, which we shortened to comping. So Julia, while I've been talking now, has been comping, and she will accompany me when I play the trumpet, or play, uh, you know, solos, play the melody, et cetera, et cetera. All right, that brings it to me in the horn section. Now, the horn section in a typical jazz combo, or jazz quartet, or jazz group of any kind, may consist of a number of instruments, including trumpet, trombone, Tenor saxophone, alto saxophone, baritone saxophone, any of the saxophones, uh, clarinet, flute, sometimes you might have a harmonica or a recorder or a melodica or some kind of other thing. But uh, our job in the horn section is to play the melodies and to play solos. We in the horn section rely on the rhythm section for the rhythm and for the harmony. And the rhythm section relies on us in the horn section for a tenuous sense of existential reality. For a, for a sense of purpose in all this music, and together it's a symbiotic relationship. All right, so moving along, the band, as we've been talking, has been playing a very common 12-measure form known as the blues. A blues typically consists of 12 measures, and uh, it can change a lot. There's a lot of variability in the blues form, but very typically we will have four chords, and they go like this. The one chord of the key, the four chord of the key, back to the one. We stay on the one for another bar, then it goes to the four chord. Four. 
back to the one. And the last four bars of the blues is called the turnaround. It goes two, five, one. Now this is a blues in the key of F, so the chords are gonna be F7 to B flat seven to F7. Going on to B flat seven, B flat seven, back to F7. Once again, to turn around, we get G minor seven, C seven, back to F7 again. Now, most jazz tunes have a unique chord progression based on the melody of the tune, the atmosphere that the composer is trying to create. But a blues is one of a number of forms that can be uh, used for a number of different tunes and provides the basis for a lot of different tunes that we play. So a blues is the most common form that you run into in jazz. There are a couple other ones that you see that are common forms, but certainly uh, the blues is a great one to start with because we're dealing with a relatively simple chord progression and it's really the basis for what we do, not only in jazz, but in rock and funk and just about all of American popular music. All right, so now we're gonna talk about how we relate as improvisers to these underlying chords. So for each chord in the form, there is a scale or mode that is most consonant to that underlying chord. So if we can learn these various scales and how to improvise with them, how to invent melodies using these scales, we can relate to the chords in such a way that the whole thing sounds harmonious, even though we're all improvising at the same time. So we're gonna go over each chord one at a time in the blues and talk about some of these scales that I might choose to use. So let's start with the F7. So this is the one chord. We're just gonna hang out on F7. We've abandoned the form. We're gonna hang out on F7 for a minute. On that F7 chord, the F7 is an F major triad with a flat seventh on top. So an E flat. So that's gonna sound like this. There it is. Now I'm gonna play, generally speaking, on that F7 chord, I'm gonna play an F mixolydian scale, an F mixolydian mode. Mixolydian is a major scale, but with a flatted seventh. And that flatted seventh is gonna match with what's going on in the chords. And that scale is gonna sound a little something like this. All right, from our F7 chord, we're gonna move on to the next chord, the four chord in the F major scale, and that is going to be the B flat seven chord, and we will come in right here. All right, that's the four chord. Now, just like with the F7 is an F mixolydian scale, for the B flat seven, I will tend to use a B flat mixolydian scale, which once again is gonna be the B flat major scale for the flat seven, and that is going to sound like this. Now typically in the blues form, we go back to the F7, but we're gonna skip ahead to the last four bars of the blues, which is called the turnaround. And the turnaround gets us back to the top again. Now the turnaround consists in this particular jazz blues of a very, very common chord progression that we know as the two, five, one. And that is because it starts on the second chord of the key of F, goes to the five chord, and then we're back to the one again. So two, five, one. This is a little chord progression that makes up a lot of different tunes that you will hear. But for now, we're gonna stick to one chord at a time. So we're gonna go with G minor seven to start. It's gonna be right here. All right, now for the G minor seven, my tendency is going to be to use a G Dorian mode, which is gonna be a G minor scale with a natural six, flat three, flat seven, but natural six. And that sounds a little something like this. From there, we move on to the five chord, coming to the end of the turnaround here, and that's gonna be your C7 chord, and that's gonna sound like this. And for that, just like with the F7 and the B flat seven, I'm gonna use the C mixolydian mode, and that's gonna sound like this. All 
right, so those are the four modes, the four chords and corresponding consonant modes that we might use on a blues such as this. And we're going to return to the blues form now. So we're back in the 12-bar form, known as the blues. And we're going to take a little time now to play a melody that I wrote for this occasion to avoid any copyright strikes on my YouTube channel. And then I'm going to take a one chorus solo. A chorus is one time through the whole form. It's going to sound like this. is to use some of those more consonant modes that you've heard. But there's also a number of different kinds of scales that you can use, and that's up to the improviser to decide. So one very common alternate scale I could use would be the blues scale. That's a very common one, and that's going to sound a little something like this. so much fun is that each individual musician has their own personal sound and oftentimes you can hear the way that a musician you can identify a musician by just one or two notes now a part of that musician's individual sound is their tone on the instrument uh, you know what instrument they're playing as well as what kinds of rhythms and melodies and what their influences are any number of different things that will make up a musician but one of the things that you can also uh, hear in a musician's sound is the way they choose to use consonants versus dissonance. So very commonly, you know, you would think of uh, dissonant notes. We might have traditionally heard dissonant notes as being referred to as wrong notes. But in our post-Eric Dolphy world, it's just another choice. Any kind of uh, creative musician can choose to use more dissonant sounds, dissonant scales, dissonant intervals in his or her improvisations. And that's going to be a part of his or her characteristic sound. So I'm going to show you a little bit about what happens if I take it outside of those chords that we played in those regular modes and take it into a different realm. And that's going to sound a little something like this. So anything's possible here in the world of jazz music. We're taking it out. We're having a good, good old time here. All right, so usually you will play the head in. The head in is the melody. So we played that already. And then everybody in the band will take a little solo. We'll trade around. It could be any length, but for now we're going to stick to one chorus. And we're going to start with Julia Chen on the piano. solo for Mr. Julian Smith. All 
All right, and once everybody takes a solo of their own chosen length, whatever, the, however much they, they want to say in the uh, whole grand scheme of the form, comes time for the drum solo. Now, there's a couple of different options that we have for the drum solo, but one option is called Trading Fours. And in Trading Fours, what we're going to do is each of us will go around in the band and take four bar improvisations, trading with Evan over here on the drums throughout the form. So we're going to stick with the form, but we're just each going to take a little four bar solo. Now, you could trade eights, you could trade 16s, you could probably trade 32s and 64s, but it might get a little unwieldy. So we're going to stick to fours for now, and that sounds a little something like this. one option for a drum solo. The other very common option is for the drummer to take an unaccompanied solo. And even though the drummer is going to be playing by himself without any kind of accompaniment by any of the harmonic instruments, he's still going to follow the form. So he might play one chorus, two chorus, three choruses, however many choruses. And that's going to sound like this. In this case, we're just going to take one chorus of drum solo. Here we go. Evan Hyde. Typically after the drum solo, we'd go right back into the head out, just like the melody in is called the head in. The melody on the end of the tune is called the head out. So we're going to play the head out now for you and close out this tune. Hope you had a little fun. Here we go. That's a little introduction on how jazz improvisation works. We got the instruments in a regular jazz combo. There may be many other different instruments that we haven't covered here, and anything goes. But for now, this is a very standard instrumentation. After that, we've got the chords of the tune. Once again, the blues is just one of a number of different forms. Usually, jazz tunes will have their own unique chord progressions. But it's a good place to start with the blues because it's a common one that you will run into regularly. We've got four chords in this one. Each of those chords has a scale that is most consonant to that chord that we can use to create melodies. At any given time, any one of us in the band becomes the composer. So it's always a very exciting, it's an exciting style of music because all of a sudden, the job of the individual musician becomes the job of the composer in a spontaneous fashion and we all will interact with each other we all have the opportunity to listen in very closely to what the other one is playing and to try to interact in such a way that we can make beautiful music and have a good old time uh, after that we're able to expand on what we're doing beyond the normal chords that we have and really try to capture some interesting rhythms and in the whole process of the thing really try to capture our own view of the very essence of the human condition and try to convey that through sound to the adoring fans in the audience. All right, gang, and that is a little bit on how to jazz. All right, gang, and there you have it, a little rundown on the fundamental mechanics of how jazz music works. Hope that clears up a little confusion surrounding what's going on while we're playing, and I hope it inspires you to go check out some great records, go check out some live music, and pick up your own instrument, go hang out with your friends, and try some of these ideas out for yourself. 
If you like this video, be sure to give it a like and subscribe to the channel for more videos on jazz music, improvisation, and music theory going forward. Also, if you have any questions on any of the topics that we covered in this video, be sure to leave them in the comments below, and I'll do my best to get back to you and clear up any residual confusion on the topic at hand. All right, gang. Well, until next time, be sure to go check out some great records and have a lot of fun with it, and I'll catch you on the next one. See ya. Theory with Bob. All right, friends. Thanks so much for checking out this video. I hope it helped in your understanding of the musical world and in your pursuit of the majesty of musical self-expression. If you like this video, you can let us know by giving it a like, and be sure to subscribe to the channel for more musical education videos going forward. You can also follow me on Instagram, at Bob Spellman, for some more musical fun. The Ridgewood School of Music is now accepting new students online, as well as in person in the Brooklyn, Queens, and greater New York City area. You can find us on our website at www.ridgewoodschoolofmusic.com or you can send us an email at ridgewoodschoolofmusic at gmail.com and we'll get back to you as soon as we can, try to set you up with a great teacher for the kinds of music that you're looking to study. All right, gang, well, thanks again, and until next time, happy practicing. <laughs> <laughs>